The time had come for us to untie the lines that we had wrapped around bushes and trees, to leave the canals that SB and Esperado, our Venikin's 40 sailboat, had called home for several years now as we would be sailing without any auxiliary propulsion. The weather would have to be calm enough for us to get a tow out of the snaking harbor, and the wind direction would have to be favorable for us to sail north. But the prevailing easterlies and southeasterlies that would be favorable sailing north could also probably make the exit from the canal difficult and dangerous. Of course, having no wind at all could simply make it impossible to sail. Last video we installed an outboard bracket hoping to have a temporary outboard motor for our trip to the boatyard. We also prepared for the trip with several last minute projects. Signs of hurricane season were upon us. Bouts of rain were quenching the jungle landscape. New critters were spawning and hatching. And unfortunately, the birds that made the nest on our anchor roller, and who we had to relocate to a nearby tree, did not find their chicks at the new spot. This felt like a bad omen. However, it was time to leave. We recruited the help of three brave friends in two pongas, who agreed to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. The earlier the start, the better. At first, they pulled us from the single line at the bow, but the canal is winding and full of obstacles. So after a small amount of rearrangement, the larger panga side tied, and we used the help of the smaller engine panga to guide the bow a bit. As we approached the exit, we were pleased that the calm weather was making the sea flat. However, we wondered if there was going to be enough wind to sail at all. I held the emergency tiller while Robbie rolled out the main, and then he raised the jib. Then we were moving at about three or four knots, of course with a little current helping us along. Now that we were off and free, first thing was first, time to set up the fishing gear. Robbie's temporary rod holder with zip ties. And the deck needed to be swept from the jungle debris. It's already a mess in there. No. My bicycle awkwardly sitting there. Oi, Choco, you're in your cabin. Oh, I didn't mean to disturb you. Hmm? Oh, we don't want to let you outside because you're a menace. This would pretty much be the first food being prepared in this newish galley while underway. A refreshing fruit salad of the wonderful Mexican mango and pitaya.
a little bit of fresh mint as well. A great addition to any fruit mix. I had this all to myself, as Robbie and Choco were not in the mood for something crisp and natural this morning. It became clear pretty fast that steering with only the emergency tiller meant having less leverage and having to apply a disproportionate amount of pressure to move the rudder, even in these calm conditions. Of course, we don't have uh, self-steering on this boat or an auto helm. Of course not. We don't do it that way here. <laughs> we never have autopilots. Wrapping a rope around the tiller not only helped to winch the lever over to one side or the other, but it also allowed us to tie it off temporarily, to hold the boat steady for a moment if need be. There's always somebody messing with my reel. What did they do? They just changed the side of the... Somebody else used your fishing rod and put the handle on the wrong side? I must have changed it for someone I forgot with. About two or three hours into the journey, we ran out of wind almost entirely in front of Playa del Carmen. We're kind of moving and then we stop moving. I was slow enough that I can jig. That's good. That's the silver lining. When the boat is no longer moving, it's a good time to switch from trolling to jigging. Mostly tuna and wahoo. Maybe an oarfish or queen snapper. I don't know if I'm getting close to the bottom or not. I think it's pretty deep here in front of Playa. Yeah, it's pretty deep here. Suddenly, there's a swarm of bees. We were drifting ever so slightly towards the busy ferry dock in Playa's waterfront. We would be forced to throw down an anchor right in the middle of a ferry route if we got too close to the shore. But we had hope. We could see a dark line on the horizon approaching steadily, a lick of wind coming. And we were off again, leaving the bees in our dust. The steering was a little harder now, but we were keeping things manageable with the rope. All the way upwards along the Riviera Maya, the Gulf Stream current pushes north, and it carried us smoothly towards Isla Mujeres. While there was plenty of sargasso weed being pulled in, Robbie managed to hook a couple of bonito as well. Choco was standing by, expecting his usual cut. Approaching the corner of Cancun, everything was pretty chill, although seeing a massive amount of seaweed caused by excessive man-made nitrogen and warming ocean temperatures is always unnerving. Despite the sargasso, Robbie found another fish. I'm gonna get wet! Is that a mackerel? Yeah. yeah. Actually, two.
a couple of king mackerels. Always get them when they get too close to it. As night was falling, we were approaching Isla Mujeres. We knew that we would probably arrive here in the dark, but we had arranged to meet up with a local sailor named Mike. He kindly came out to us in the dark and towed us into the anchorage. We snuck past the busy ferry dock and tucked into the inner lagoon as our flashlights all died and our house battery seemed to sputter and cough out its final goodbye. The inner lagoon anchorage at Isla Mujeres is pretty much reserved only for emergencies, and we were stuck in the spot for about a week, trying to find out if we could get hauled out at the nearby boatyard, looking for an outboard or looking for a tow to get to another spot. It's a particularly traffic-prone area, so we finally decided to pick up anchor and to move to the less protected outer anchorage. Again, there really wasn't enough wind in this protected place to maneuver easily, However, the wind finally caught our mane and started pushing us towards the exit. That's when we noticed one of our neighbors over at the dock come out and he asked if we needed help. Ines was moving and everything was pretty much under control. However, in the narrowest part of the passage, we knew that we would likely run out of steam. So we asked him to give us a push if that happened. If we're lucky, there's a breeze. Thanks. In the narrowest part, we were indeed happy to have our friendly neighbor there for a bit of a push. And then our previous helper, Mike, also showed up to help out again. But then we were just about at the new anchoring spot. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Glad guys. We should just keep going. <laughs> Why stop? Up an anchor. Well, Can because we don't have any drinking water left, yes. <laughs> and our battery is destroyed, so... We can eat stop the fish and drink human urine now! We wanted to be as close to the beach as possible to collect water and provisions, because we were going to leave Isla Mujeres. When we were just about at the right spot, we turned directly into the wind, waited a moment for the mainsail to flap and the boat to slow down, then Robbie let down the anchor. Without the ability to go into reverse and to dig the anchor into the bottom nicely, we would simply have to jump in and check it out, and bury the anchor if needed. Before the boat began to set sail again at anchor, we rolled in the main. A meter and a half under the keel. A uh, meter? A boat, this boat is like super shallow raft. Really? Yeah. I could probably stand up between underneath the keel. The bottom here is very grassy, which is not great holding, but Robbie observed that our anchor had found a nice soft sandy spot up ahead. Here 
Here we would stay while getting tank water from the boatyard and drinking water from the nearby corner store. My bicycle was also handy for picking up groceries from the island's various grocery stores. The outer anchorage was just as busy as the inner one, but now the tour operators seem to be buzzing past us a lot less close to the boat. Less grumpy about our precarious situation as the disabled vessel on the inside. Our anchoring spot seemed to be almost a little too convenient. I wondered why it hadn't been taken already. It only took one evening to figure that out. The jet engine generator fired up on the airfield across the street from our boat. Isla had recently been using this system to deal with the upward trend of power use probably from everyone running air conditioners. As much as we loved it here at Isla Mujeres, we were already looking forward to continuing on the journey. The boatyard here was not going to fit our budget. So off we would go to Progreso, about 200 nautical miles northwest of here. Stay tuned for the next video of that journey.